Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. I, as always, am your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome. In this episode, some things you'd probably rather not know, so I guess you can turn off right now. Just kidding, don't leave. Please, please, if you leave at this point in the video, it's terrible for my retention and then no one sees this video and it's a disaster. Thank you to Kevin who wrote it, the format of the show. If you're new here, I'm going to read this script. I've never read it before. Let's jump in. There is an endless amount of information that you'd rather not know for a variety of different reasons. For example, I could tell you in great de detail how the square sum problem was solved last year for all of n greater than 24, but I'm willing to bet that the vast majority of you aren't interested in knowing that. Oh my god, people are turning off already. They're like, square sum, what? N? No! What am I watching? I don't know, but I hate it. Obviously, that's not the sort of stuff I'm going to be telling you about today because I'd like you to actually watch the f***ing video. Instead, we'll be talking about gross, depressing, or scary things that you'd rather not know. You know, like how everybody now knows that when you flush the toilet, it spreads fecal matter all over your bathroom. <laughs> Fun fact, I just recorded a Brain Blaze video before that, before this. And in between, I took a shit and flushed uh, fecal matter all over my bathroom. Now I feel dirty. <laughs> he shit! There is no part of me that is happier having learned that, but at least I can be extra paranoid now about making sure my toothbrush is kept contained somewhere that fecal particles can't land on it. But since we're already on the topic of fecal matter, that sounds like as good a place as any to start a good cup of coffee. Oh my god, no. How many feces are in my coffee? Hmm. Lots. Cool. This coffee smells like sh I first tried drinking coffee when I was camping as a kid because back in the days before there was a Starbucks or Dunks. Dunking Donuts! Hey, on every corner. It was largely an adult beverage. I wanted to feel like a cool, mature adult, but I hated every sip of it. I've tried several times throughout my life to try and force myself to like coffee, but every time I'm haunted by the inescapable fact that coffee tastes like the insides of my arsehole. Kevin. The inside of your arsehole's delicious, Kevin. It's delicious. <laughs> Holy shit. What? 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 What the hell? What? I'm interrupting today's video to tell you about the legends over at Squarespace who are sponsoring today's video, making this all possible. Thank you, Squarespace. We love you, Squarespace. You've been with us forever, Squarespace. Thank you. Thank you so much. But that's not what you're here for. That's not why you sponsor me. Not for thanks. Not for thanks, but for me to drive some custom to you, Squarespace. And that should be easy to do. Because Squarespace do is fantastic. Look, if you need to make a website, there is no other place to do it other than Squarespace. They allow you, I don't know, look, I don't sell anything online, but I have a Squarespace website. It has all my little YouTube channels on there. You know, it's got my little homepage. It's got an about me, little contact form, all of that good stuff. And it was made super easily using Squarespace. But whether you want to sell something, maybe you're a business, maybe you're an existing business, and you're just like, my website looks a bit old and janky. Well, make a new one with Squarespace. What you do on Squarespace, you start with a template, there's a huge selection, they're professional, they're fun, whatever you want, you're going to find it on there. And then you use this new thing, it's a next generation website designer called Fluid Engine, and it takes drag and drop to the next level. You just go in there, you choose your template, and then you're like, whoosh, 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 move stuff around, boom. Before you know it, you are done. You've got a beautiful website that looks like it was designed by a pro, even if it was designed by you, or in this case, me. Like, my website looks good. I know nothing about design, and it was all me, baby. Plus, Squarespace give you access to vetted third-party tools, so you know they're safe and you know they're good for your website, giving it a lot more functionality. It's like having a toolkit of awesome features right at your fingertips. Plus, they've got email campaigns. I used to pay a fortune to an unnamed company to do email campaigns, which I never actually used. And then I found out it was included in Squarespace, and I was like, cool, that's going to save me literally hundreds of dollars a month. And then I just moved everything over to Squarespace, and that was uh, better and easier and wonderful. Whether you want to welcome new subscribers, announce a sale, or send exclusive discounts to your top customers, Squarespace has got you covered. Plus, built-in analytics help you measure the impact of every email you send. So look, when you're ready to take your online presence to the next level, do it with our friends over at Squarespace. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash blaze to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain using the promo code blaze. And as I said, it helps support the show, doesn't it? It helps get these blazers in front of your eyeballs. So thank you, Squarespace. Thank you, dear viewer, who I'm sure is going to go over to Squarespace right now and get that website. Am I right? Am I right, Peter? And now, Back to today's video. I don't know. <laughs> That's f***ed up, dude. I mean... <laughs> I don't know how you all do it, but I'll stick to my Diet Coke. Thank you very much. But for those of you who work in an office, there's a good chance that your coffee tastes like ours too. Even if I work in an office. Even if you can't taste it, the fecal matter is there, and it's all over your coffee mug. 
Research has shown that up to 90% of mugs in office kitchens are covered in germs, with 20% of them laced with feces. I'm going to go ahead and say, look, my office, it's just me. It's just me. I'm the only one who works here. So I don't... If there's anyone, anyone's feces all over this mug, it's only mine. And as we all know, it's totally fine to eat your own feces. It's just not okay to eat other people's feces. Everyone knows that. We've known that since we were children. The silver lining is that if you work in an office that just uses cheap disposable paper cups instead of reusable mugs, you won't have this problem. The issue doesn't come from the mugs themselves. It comes from the sponges and the dish towels. Oh yeah, all of that shit is disgusting anyway. I pretty much don't wash up. Like, I'm always, it's always dishwasher, always dishwasher, because it just does a better job of cleaning than, like, that nasty-ass sponge that's just been sitting there, and you're like, have you ever smelled a sponge that hasn't been washed in a while? Don't do that. No, look at it! Hi. A sensible human being should have a kitchen sponge and a bathroom sponge, and never should the two meet. Who the f*** is using their bathroom sponge in the kitchen? That's up why would you ever do that it'll be a cold day in hell before i wash my dishes with the same sponge i use to scrub my toilet washing dishes i'm always like look when i was a kid we had this rule in my in my parents house that you can load whatever it goes into the dishwasher and then after a bit, everything else has to be washed up now i'm an adult i'm like Fuck that what we do is we load the dishwasher we run the dishwasher and everything that doesn't fit that round gets stacked up on that shelf above the dishwasher and then when the dishwasher's done you unload it and you load the rest of the in and you run it again because <laughs> i'm not washing up and all those non-stick pans that are like don't go in the dishwasher i'm like well guess what <laughs> They're going in the dishwasher. And when they're not non-sticky anymore, I'm buying new ones. Because <laughs> that's how gangster I am. How dare you? Unfortunately, it seems officers, for whatever reason, aren't as concerned with cross-contamination as they should be. When clean mugs were wiped with a dish towel in an office kitchen, 100% of mugs that were previously clean became encrusted in germs of varying levels of danger. It's probably best to bring your mug home yourself to wash, or even better, just keep two fresh litres of soda at your desk to help you get through the day. Two litres of soda? God damn, Kevin! You are an American, aren't you? Oh, well, we could actually just take care of ourselves and get an appropriate amount of sleep each night, so we aren't desperately reliant on cash to help us get through the day but that's obviously never gonna happen exactly Kevin. exactly <laughs> ah life force drinking out of cups sticking on the topic of drinking vests do you have to kevin i'm trying right now to just enjoy this pretty cold coffee that has been sitting here since the beginning of the brain blaze that i recorded directly before this one in between where i took a do you remember? There's not a lot I'd be less inclined to drink from than a mug with 20% chance of being contaminated with feces. There's not a lot, but there is something, and that would be a human skull. As it turns out, people have... That's not a real human skull, by the way. Uh, <laughs> be a bit worrying if it was, wasn't it? People have been using human skulls as cups and bowls for thousands of years. The oldest known specific one was recently discovered in England and dates back nearly 15,000 years. Once a person was dead, the top of their skull would be cut off and all the blood and fleshy bits would be cleaned out, and then it was good to go as your fancy new dinnerware. The second craziest part of this is that pottery dates back to at least 29,000 years, meaning that this practice was wholly unnecessary. With the ability to create pottery bowls having long since existed, and ancient people weren't using human skulls as bowls or cups because they had to. They were doing it because they wanted to. Hey guys, I'm in New York City just hanging out. I will drink from your skull! But the craziest part is that the practice never actually went away. It's remained common for entirely too long, being practiced well into the years that ended in AD instead of BC. I mean, you can imagine some like brutal cultures or whatever being like, yeah, 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 we eat out of the, the skulls of our enemies or some shit. I bet there's some weird tribes or like horrible sh that's gone on in wars where this still happens today right by around 500 AD, it was pretty common for the skulls to be coated in gold or some of the metal which would theoretically negate the need for the skull in the first place they seem to mostly be used for religious or ceremonial purposes by this point as well but not entirely skull cups also continue to be used to this day and you can purchase them online for about the same price as a complete authentic human skull the f you could buy that on the internet like on the regular non-dark web internet that's kind of how much is a fucking human skull that fucked up what? One of the most bizarre examples from recentish times comes from none other than the famous British poet Lord Byron. His gardener was digging one day and came across a skull. Lord Byron was struck by how large and well preserved the skull was, assuming it belonged to some monk or friar that had lived at his home shortly before it was disbanded as a monastery. In modern times, if you found a human skull in your garden, you'd call the police because that shouldn't be there. Would you? Like. Hang on. But there's. I mean. It's, it's almost certainly going to be from, like, some old battle or something. It's not going to be, like, a modern murder skull. 
Although I guess I would call the police. Would I? I don't know. I'd ask my mates. <laughs> do you have to call the police? I found a skull. They'd be like, no, it's probably just really old. What do you do? I, okay, I get... I, look, I don't know. I don't, I've never found a fucking skull, okay? I've only thought about it this very moment. I'm also not really going and digging around in my garden for skulls or anything. But Lord Byron did the only logical thing for a 19th century British lord to do at the time. He carried the skull into town and had it fashioned into a drinking cup. He even wrote a poem, lines inscribed upon a cup formed from a skull, about how much happier the skull's former owners should be now that it was used as a cup instead of just rotting in the ground. Okay, Byron. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I'd be happier about that. If someone was using my skull as a cup, I'd be like, bro, don't use my skull as a cup. It's disrespectful. <laughs> Someone's going to, like, in a hundred years, someone will see this video, dig out my bony head and be like, I'm going to use this fucking skull as a cup just like he didn't want. There's going to be someone eating Cheerios out of my skull. <laughs> based on a true story. Movies claim to be based on true stories all the time, and it generally means very little. The comedy Cocaine Bear, in which a bear ingests a shit ton of cocaine and then goes on a killing rampage, is based on a true story, but only slightly. It's true that in 1985, a £175 pound black bear ingested 75 pounds of cocaine, and it's also true that he was given the name Pablo Escobar. But the only death was its own. According to the autopsy, the bear had only absorbed three or four grams of cocaine into its system, but it must have fucking loved that shit because its stomach was packed to the brim with coke. Needless to say, writers will take a rather large amount of liberties with what constitutes a true story, but sometimes a movie really is based on or inspired by real events without being billed as such. One such movie that is based on a much more true story than we may like is A Nightmare on Elm Street. Never seen it. To the surprise of nobody. The psychotic and often hilarious child murderer Freddy Krueger wasn't based on a real person per se, but the manner in which his victims died sadly was. Res Craven's inspiration came from a series of articles in the Los Angeles Times about the Hmong refugees who had fled to the United States from Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. <laughs> I realized the nightmare on Elm Street. For some reason, I was thinking of the nightmare before Christmas, that animated movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're totally different. They're, they're really different. Once that I've never seen either of them, though. But I'm, I know they're different, because one's got Freddy Krueger in it, who I had heard of, and the other one's like an animated thing for children, isn't it? Once the refugees were here, many people began suffering from intense nightmares and refused to sleep. On at least three occasions, someone who had been staying awake to avoid nightmares finally succumbed to their exhaustion and fell asleep. Once asleep, the nightmares returned. All three of those reported on died in their sleep while screaming out in terror from their nightmares. Jesus Christ. The newspaper reported on these incidents individually, but never correlated them. The victims were believed to have suffered from sudden unexplained death syndrome. So yes, one of the greatest horror movie franchises of all time was inspired by people in close proximity to one another who suddenly died in their sleep during nightmares, with no definitive explanation as to what happened. So that's fun. Surely f***ing not. That's mental. Oh my god, people die in nightmares? <laughs> don't like that. It's always hard. Oh, no, I'm going to die in my nightmares. And then you wake up, you're like, oh, it's just a nightmare. The f man. Go to sleep right now. <laughs> Eyelash mites. By this point in time, everybody should probably know that their skin is crawling with about 1.5 trillion bacteria. This is generally beneficial or at least not harmful. Some research has shown that these bacteria help the immune system fight off other, more dangerous bacteria that might attack our bodies. They're also extremely tiny, generally only one or two microns in diameter, so it's easy not to think about them. But there are, I'm thinking about them right now, Kevin, and I don't like it. But there are other parasites living on your body as well in the form of eyelash mites, also known as demodex mites. These are about 400 times larger than bacteria, and 0.4 millimeters, they're still invisible to the naked eye, but don't require that much magnification to see. These cigar-shaped, eight-legged arachnids live on your eyelashes and in the folds of your eyelids. Ah! During the day, they lie dormant. Ah! <laughs> but at night, they come out to feast. Oh, f Kevin, I didn't need to know this. Ah! Gonna cry. Like the bacteria on our bodies, those mites are also regarded as being beneficial. Oh, thank God, but I still don't like them, the little cigar-shaped weirdos. They survive on a diet of dead skin cells and oils from our eyelash follicles, so they're actually like tiny little housekeeping spiders that live on our eyes. I don't want spiders on my eyes! No one wants spiders on their eyes! Of course, because they eat, they also have to excrete waste. I don't want the shitting spiders on my eyes, Kevin! 
I didn't need to know this. Why do we make these videos? So that lustrous sheen on a person's eyelash is actually just spider sh Okay, probably not, because they can only generate so much waste, but their poop is all over your eyelashes and eyelids. While these are normally helpful parasites, they can also be too much of a good thing. Something like a blocked oil gland can create an overabundance of food that allows the mites to reproduce more than they normally would. This infestation can result in irritation around the eyelid and cause your eyelashes to become loose or grow in the wrong direction. So... <laughs> Inwards. <laughs> so while the idea that the average person swallows eight spiders a year in their sleep is obviously a ridiculous lie, the average person does have between a thousand and two thousand spiders living on their face. Bruh. <laughs> Just make sure their population doesn't get out of control, otherwise the increased levels of spider sh** will become a detriment. Oh god. The next step entry is called brain-eating amoebas. I'm already, like, c paranoid enough about my health that I'm like, I don't... <sighs> brain-eating amoebas? What the f***, man? It's the sort of thing that sounds like a myth, but brain-eating amoebas are very real. Their actual name is Nagleria fowleri, and technically these microorganisms are not classified as a true amoeba, but we're not going to let a bunch of uptight biologists tell us what we can't and can call things. These amoebas naturally occur in warm, fresh waters like lakes, rivers, and hot springs. Well, I'm never going in a lake, a river, or a hot spring again. I swam in a river last weekend. <laughs> ah! They prefer temperatures between 80 and 115 Fahrenheit, 26 to 46 Celsius. Well, the river wasn't that warm, I'll tell you that, but they can be present in soil and sediment of colder fresh water. Oh, God. <laughs> they can even be found in water parks and swimming pools that aren't properly maintained, so feel free to go nuts with the chlorine. Some burning eyes are a small price to pay to avoid death. Surprisingly, swallowing these amoebas is actually fine. I'm not going to recommend you actively seek them out to ingest, but drinking water contaminated with the amoebas should be harmless as long as you don't laugh. No one's going to be laughing while they're drinking a brain-eating amoeba, Kevin. <laughs> Sam, do that do that meme where the kid's like got the water and he's and he's just pouring it down his face. He's like laughing while, you know, like do that one. I like it. If you laugh and the water goes out your nose, there's a good chance that you're fucked because that's how those amoebas get you. Once the amoebas get into a person's nose, usually from that person swimming in contaminated water, they enter the nerve tissue and travel to the brain. In the wild, they consume bacteria, but inside the brain, this is where bacteria aren't present, they instead feast on your neurons. As soon as this starts happening, it's too late. On average, it takes five days after an infection for symptoms to begin to manifest, and once they do, it's a death sentence. No, 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 I'm not into this at all. Death can occur anywhere from day 1 to 18 after the symptoms begin, and there's no effective treatment. Early symptoms include headache, fever, vomiting, which are pretty normal symptoms of being sick and easy to ignore. Between how rare the infection is and how quickly it becomes fatal, there haven't been opportunities to properly study various forms of treatment. I'm just glad it's rare, to be honest. The good news here is that infection from these amoebas is extremely rare, with an average of about three cases per year in the US. Actually being infected with the brain-eating amoebas is like winning the world's shittiest lottery. The bad news is that surviving this infection is like winning the lottery twice in one month. There are only three people in the US and five in the entire world who are known to have survived this infection. The most recent survivor from the US was a 12-year-old girl who became infected after swimming in the same lake that she swam in all summer, every summer. What started off as a headache turned into a trip to the hospital where her parents told her she wouldn't survive the weekend. F now, bro. I don't like this episode at all, Kevster. Luckily, they were wrong, but it wasn't a simple task. To save the girl, doctors had to cut a hole in her skull so that they could pour medicine directly into her brain, administer an experimental drug from Germany, lower her body temperature multiple degrees below the threshold for hypothermia, place her into a medically induced coma, and pray. Well, the praying was unnecessary, but all that other shit, I mean, god damn! When she was finally woken up, her brain had some scarring, but was not damaged beyond repair. It took almost two months, but after learning to walk, talk, read, and write again, she was able to leave the hospital and continue a normal life. God fucking damn, brain amoebas, fuck. Shit, dude. Woo! That's a fine-looking amoeba! Thanks, you want them? Nope. But if one of these amoebas crawls its way into your brain, you probably won't be so lucky. I don't like this at all. I don't like it at all. I hope we don't have those in Europe. Origins of the Chainsaw As you might guess from the name, Caesarean sections or C-sections date back to ancient Rome. No, they don't. That's a commonly mis... mis... Uh, mis uh, oft-repeated myth. 
If a mother died before or while giving birth, C-section is required to perform by law to attempt to save the baby. For almost 2,000 years, no, it's not named after Julius Caesar. This is just a, I, I think that's just a common misconception. I'm pretty sure I made a video about it at some point. For almost 2,000 years, this remained a last resort only used on deceased women. There are varying accounts, but the first C-section on a live mother didn't occur until at least the 1500s, if not the 1600s. I th- am I wrong about that? I feel like I'm right about that. But I don't remember. I'll ask ChatGPT after we're finished here. We didn't have antibiotics yet, and hygiene wasn't properly understood or implemented, so performing the operation on a living woman was seen as a brutally painful death sentence. One of the alternatives to C-section for a difficult childbirth was a procedure known as a symphysotomy, in which cartilage in the pubic region would be cut to widen the pelvis and hopefully facilitate the natural childbirth process. This was normally performed with a sharp knife, but it was a slow and painful process. Enter Scottish doctors John Aiken and James Jeffrey and their osteotome, also known as a motherfucking chainsaw bra. I don't like this at all. Obviously, gas powered chainsaws weren't possible yet, so the original osteotome was a smaller device operated by a hand crank. It cut in the exact same fashion as a modern chainsaw, just slower and more painful since the chain had to be cranked manually. I'll spare you any particular details and just allow you to imagine for yourself what the process of using a chainsaw to widen a woman's pelvis for childbirth might have looked like. I'm trying not to, Kevin, to be honest. The chainsaw was quickly replaced in surgery by the giggly saw, a flexible wire saw, so fortunately, women only had to injure chainsaws to the vagina for barely over a century god damn man that's where this video ends and i'm happy about it to be honest that was intense kevin i think i'm gonna dislike this video i'm gonna dislike my own video whoa i'm gonna go and do something else